Akira Toriyama is a brilliant artist and storyteller. The story that really brought him to prominence was Dr. Slump, a comedy gag manga where he got to explore more situational comedy. But the series that shot his popularity into the stratosphere was Dragon Ball. When Dragon Ball first began, it was a mix of two genres, comedy and action. You have to remember, at the time the story came out, action shonen was not as we know it today. But as the series went on, it was able to transition more and more into action, until it was completely that. This journey was a long one, however I'd like to explore it in a bit more detail. When Dragon Ball first began, the action was very straightforward, with not much strategy within it. But there was one arc where all that changed, the 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai. After watching Goku and Krillin train for so long, they got to test their abilities. But how do you make an arc feel impactful right after having a protagonist save the world? Well, simple. Instead of putting the stakes externally, you put them internally. The Tenkaichi Budokai is a martial artist tournament, a place where Goku and his friends can test their training. So in this arc, if Goku loses, the only thing that will truly be damaged is his ego. However, after watching him train for so long, this victory truly means something. It means something to him and therefore to us, the audience. Before we go any further, I'd like to discuss one big problem that arises with tournament arcs. Most tournament arcs are used in a way to allow the protagonist to flex a bit and therefore show off their power. When this happens, it usually makes it very easy for the audience to tell if the protagonist is going to win or not, and therefore make the experience not as exciting as it should be. However, early Dragon Ball usually escapes this trap because in all four times Goku has participated in a tournament, he's only won once, and even then I would argue it doesn't count. In the previous tournament, the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai, Goku actually lost, and this moment essentially announced a precedent. In these tournaments, anyone can win or lose. The 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai is in my opinion one of the greatest tournament arcs in anime. The world building, the drama, and the characters are all here. But more than anything, the emotional significance of winning meant more now that we knew Goku could lose. I believe what made this arc so impactful was that every fight was a great example of finite games. To put it simply, finite games are any duel, fight, or war that have two sides and in which the rules are set, the abilities of both opponents are known, and there's a set goal. Every finite game's goal is winning, and therefore every game has an end. The entire tournament arc is a set of finite games where players try to achieve the goal of beating their opponent. In these very personal fights, Toriyama dedicates his time to the strategic warfare that occurs among players. I would like to analyze one of my favorite finite fights in the tournament, Tan Shinhan vs Jackie Chun. In this fight, Tian is a lot more violent and aggressive than he is in his later appearances. His pure brute force makes him think he can simply overpower him. But Jackie Chun is far more methodical and tactical. In this fight, Jackie Chun tries every trick he has against his opponent. He even at some point tries to reason with him and make him see the error of his ways. But nothing works. So in the end, Jackie Chun quits. Not because he doesn't believe he could win, but to let the next generation have their spotlight. This fight not only shows us the capabilities of both fighters, but also tells us something about them. I know that compared to what we have today, this may not seem that impressive. However, if you remember when this came out, it is truly marvelous. All of this is great, but it is still only the beginning. At the end of this arc, we jump directly into the next one, and we get the introduction to what makes this series so great. Thank you.
even to this day, I will still say King Piccolo is one of the best villains in Dragon Ball. One of the many reasons why Dragon Ball villains feel so threatening is that they feel like forces of nature more than they do people. The best way I can describe it is, what makes this arc so great is the complete opposite of the tournament arc. If the Tenkaichi Butokai is a series of finite games, then the King Piccolo arc is a series of infinite ones. If finite games are games where the rules, opponent, and goals are known, then infinite games are the opposite. Infinite games are games where there are no set rules or objective. The only true goal is to keep the game going as long as possible. Many Dragon Ball villains can be characterized as infinite players. Their goals don't end once they eliminate the heroes. Afterwards, they're going to continue killing. Their actions and mindset are according to infinite games, where the game never truly ends. Moreover, a Dragon Ball villain's rules, motivation, and goals can change at a whim. One moment, they want to end humanity, and the next, they want to create a tournament. And it's here that we reach an impasse. Two finite players create a stable game, and two infinite players also create a stable game. However, the fights in Dragon Ball are better characterized as finite players versus infinite ones. With our heroes playing under concrete rules, we have an understanding of their powers and their goals, defeating the villain, while the villain usually plays with an infinite player mindset. Their rules and objectives usually fluctuate quite a bit, and there is no end to their carnage. Usually, when a finite player plays against an infinite one, they lose, since a finite player can only play for so long, while the opposition can play for much longer. But here, I think we find what makes Dragon Ball so intriguing. We are watching the story of finite players who have every odds against them, but still overcome and win in the end. And this first happens with King Piccolo. King Piccolo is arguably the first threatening villain in Dragon Ball. With all other villains, there is some humor to them. But there is nothing funny about King Piccolo. Except for his name, but that's it. He is a ruthless, superpowered killer who, as I said before, feels more like a force of nature than a real man, god, alien thing. To the point where our heroes believe brute force isn't enough. So here we see the beginning of Dragon Ball's tactical side, one that can be better described as ploy strategy. Through the King Piccolo arc, the heroes utilize ploy strategy to get the better on their opponent knowing they cannot beat him in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Their main strategy this arc is the use of the ceiling technique. Moreover, they try their best to avoid fights against his powerful minions. These tactics throughout the narrative are apparent all throughout the series. Keep the powerful villain busy for now with some kind of distraction or ploy. This way, we can find a better way to fight him in the future, whether it be through a trick or getting stronger. While all this is happening, the use of characterization through fighting, which we saw in the tournament, can be found in every other arc. This formula for storytelling starts to become the norm in Dragon Ball. As much as I do love the King Piccolo arc, I do think that there are some problems. To be fair, it is the first time Toriyama has told a story like this, so obviously it isn't perfect. However, I do think this formula was perfected later on in his career. Every arc in Dragon Ball Z is amazing, with the Cell Saga being my personal favorite. But to better prove my point, I'm going to discuss probably the most impactful saga in the series, the Frieza Saga. For a bit of context for those who might have forgotten or need a refresher, after the devastating stalemate the heroes had with Vegeta, they now find themselves without Dragon Balls, and with half their crew either being dead or out of commission. Krillin, a veteran fighter who is having trouble keeping up with the others, Bulma, a genius but no fighter, and Gohan, a literal 5 year old, goes off to Namek, a planet where they can get more Dragon Balls. But once they make it to Namek, they realize someone else is already here, Frieza, a galactic tyrant 
who is feared all across the galaxy. He is also on the planet to use the Dragon Balls to wish for immortality, and he has brought his entire army with him. Obviously, our voyagers are completely outmatched, and here, this sense of a villain being a force of nature is reinforced with Frieza, and his forces feeling like an unstoppable gigantic empire that our heroes need to face. Here, the sense of Frieza being an infinite player is palpable. Frieza seems to have infinite resources at his disposal. He can simply rewrite the rules on a whim if he wishes, and getting the Dragon Balls are only a means to achieve immortality, meaning the game will truly go on forever. This arc is a gigantic game of cat and mouse, between a web of factions trying to get the Dragon Balls before their enemy does. As finite players, what they can and, more importantly, what they can do is greatly defined. Their weaknesses in the face of everything can be seen everywhere. Considering that the Frieza Force is much stronger, they have no choice but to use ploy tactics to stay on top. Here is a small snippet of what I mean. This fight actually begins between Gohan, Krillin, and Vegeta, who have been able to steal Vegeta's Dragon Balls, but he noticed and he is now right on their tail. But before Vegeta could do anything, he senses the arrival of Frieza's top 5 generals, the Genyu Force. Frieza called them in to get back the Dragon Balls that Vegeta stole from his men, which now Gohan and Krillin have in their possession. With this new development, Vegeta has no other choice than to team up with Gohan and Krillin. Do you see how almost immediately the current situation can be turned on its head? Enemies that were 2 seconds away from killing each other can team up almost instantly to adapt to a new situation. Many people think that Dragon Ball is just fighting, but it is so much more than that. In this saga, the way individuals advance goals and get the upper hand on others is through more than just simply fists, but through tactics. Another perfect example are power levels. At this point, power levels were still a novice concept, and the entire Frieza force, including Frieza himself, still depended on scouters to not only tell how powerful someone was, but also to use it to detect people at a distance, while our heroes and Vegeta somehow can simply sense it. This adds a whole new layer to the strategy of the battle. Our heroes can hide from the enemies by lowering their key, while the enemies cannot. Vegeta takes this huge opportunity to destroy all scouters on Namek and essentially blind the entire Frieza force. Aspects like these are littered everywhere in this arc and beyond, which forces our heroes to really think critically about their own actions. And while all of this is happening, the use of character building in battles is still in full display. All of these aspects combined together help to enhance the overall action. In this game of chess that the heroes are playing with their enemies, everyone is always doing something. If it's not fighting, it's finding a way to fight or giving someone else the chance to fight, which also creates a revolving door of characters that all take their turn at the main villain. And yeah, I think I'm done. But before that, here are a few parting words before I leave. It may be true that Dragon Ball's story is simplistic, However, that is one of the many things I love about it so much. Dragon Ball knows exactly what it is and does it beautifully, telling a fun and engaging story in the process. Most of the strategy we see in Dragon Ball cannot compare to the ones we have today, but almost all of them were inspired by Dragon Ball. And this inspiration can be seen in the groundworks for later shonens, as these series also explore game theory which is a topic I'd like to explore another time. But for now, that's it. Thanks for watching.